Good morning and welcome. We're so excited everybody is here and we are going to be challenged by this enlightening lecture. Um, I'm Mary Tatum, for those of you who don't know me, and um, we're so excited to have Ian Clark here. Ian is the chaplain at the Marine base and he is the chaplain for the recruits. Ian is a Presbyterian minister, ordained Presbyterian minister. He went to the Citadel guys and he went to Princeton Theological um, Seminary. He is currently working on his PhD as a candidate um, in uh, Christian theological ethics. And we are delighted that he is here today to enlighten us. He has two precious girls that are three and 10 months old, so I know he's tired. <laughs> doing wonders. But, yet he, but yet he is here to teach us. Anyway, so we are so grateful to be enlightened by him because in this, we are called to be peacemakers, of course, and there is much injustice in the world, and there is much discord right now as well as war. So I am so excited that we have him here to give us a lecture so that we might be better people of faith going out in peace in this world, understanding our Christian ethics. So, so Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, thank you, first of all, for that, uh, that kind introduction. And thank all of you. I know it is a Tuesday at 11 a.m., so I know you could be anywhere right now. Thank you for spending a little bit of time here uh, to learn about this topic. War is not the most pleasant of topics to talk about by any means, but it is a real topic. All right, as any of us know, if we opened up the news this morning, it was probably the first thing that we saw. There is conflict that is raging right now in the Holy Land. We can't forget what's happening in Ukraine. There is tension building up in the Red Sea, in the South China Sea, all over the world. It sometimes feels like we're sitting on a little bit of a powder keg. And I think people of faith, Christians like you and I, are right to ask good and hard questions of, what does our faith have to say about this? How do we wrestle with this question and these very complex realities in a way that honors our commitment to be disciples of Jesus Christ? So I'm so glad you're here to wrestle uh, with these questions along with me. It's a real joy to be here. Let me just start with a little bit of, of a disclaimer, right? I'm a government employee, so I'm gonna give you my disclaimer, right? <laughs> you have probably noticed, or if you haven't, I will tell you, as a chaplain, we have two devices on our collar. This one's our rank device, so it says I'm a lieutenant in the Navy. This one's actually a cross, and it says that I am a Christian pastor who is endorsed for service as a chaplain. Sometimes as chaplains, we like to say that we lean on one side of the cross, or one side of the collar, or another. Today, I'm going to lean on this side, right? So I'm going to be speaking to you as a Presbyterian minister. And the reason that I say that is because we're going to be talking about a lot of theory, but of course we might talk about some things that are playing out in the world right before our eyes. I don't want you to think that I'm necessarily speaking on behalf of the Department of the Navy or the Department of Defense, anything like that. I'm speaking as a faith leader in this capacity in a church. Um, but obviously inform my decisions and topics based on you know, what we know. All right, so I wanna start off with kind of a thorny question. Now, I bet most people have wondered at one point or another, they flipped through scripture and they've come across uh, war texts, texts in the Old Testament, even some in the New, that kind of let's just say, unsettle the conscience. Have you all had that experience a little bit? You know what I'm talking about? I certainly have. I've read texts, and I'm a military chaplain. I read texts, and I say, ooh, that doesn't sound like the God I know and love, does it? Right? These are complicated texts. And so I want to actually start there. I want to help us think a little bit better, without digging into any particular text, I want us to think a little bit about where some of those texts came from, so that we can lay the groundwork for going in to the ethics thereof. Does that sound okay? Yes. All right, so let's start with a little thought experiment. And so here's what I want to do, right? I want to play a little imaginative game with you, if you will. And I want to invite you to do me a favor 
and close your eyes. I'm gonna give you a scenario. We're gonna talk through something. And as I talk, just imagine what comes to mind for you. And I'll tell you when I'm ready for you to open up your eyes. Okay. I want you to imagine a very rural community. I want you to imagine this community thousands of years back. There's no technology to speak of, at least not in the way that we think about it today. Now, this imagined rural community is highly dependent on agriculture. Farming is central to their way of life. It's central to their very survival. In one way, shape, or form, everyone in this community that you are imagining is involved in agriculture. But the community that you're imagining has a little bit of a challenge, and that's that they have only limited access to water. The sea is far away, there's only small lakes and rivers and streams nearby, and so the weather greatly impacts their production. If the weather holds out in this community that you're imagining in your mind's eye, the crops will be plentiful and they will be nourishing. But if too much or too little rain falls, the crops could be destroyed. The same is true of sudden freezes or windstorms, and if that happens, there's a very real chance of famine, death, and suffering. The community that you're imagining, though, is a faithful one, as was every known community of antiquity at this time frame. They believe in a supreme God, and so for argument's sake, let's imagine a God, we're gonna make up this God, and I'm gonna give him a made-up name, Zerah. It's an ancient word for sea. The people in our community, the one that you're imagining right now, they put their hope and their trust in Zara. They have texts that speak of Zara's historical work. They sacrifice to Zara. They have festivals for Zara. They teach their children to be obedient to Zara. They worship Zara. They got songs about this deity. Consideration of Zara shapes their law, their culture, their sense of right and wrong. And open your eyes for me. I want to ask you a question. This is an imagined, imagined situation. Let me ask you this question. In your own words, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up if you're comfortable doing it. In your own words, what are Zara's attributes? Right? What is Zara known for? This imagined God in this imagined uh, scenario that we just see. What, what would you tell me about this God? What do you think the people believe about this God to be true? What keeps Zara happy? How is this God known to us in the world? What, what, what do you think? Yeah. I'm going to guess that Zara is the giver or keeper of rain. Okay, good. So there's, there's a connection there between the weather and this God, right? Where if we're so dependent on what's going on in our natural world, if agriculture is so important to us, probably going to be a connection between that need and, and the God, right? What else? Any other ideas? Yeah. Supreme authority. Okay. So this God is going to have a, authority over everything. It's something we can depend on. We don't have necessarily connection to the wider world. We don't have technology like we talked about. So we're really dependent on this God for a lot of things, right? Good. What else? Any other thoughts pop into mind? Yeah. Well, then if you were going to try <clears throat> to act, act to do what you think Zara wants you to do in order to, for him to give you the benefits you need. Okay, great. So there's a relationship element, right? If I sacrifice or if I pray or if I do this, I'm going to receive this benefit that's rooted in my need uh, from, from this deity, right? Good. So it's fundamental to how we understand what our practice is, too. Yeah, any other thoughts? I would assume there's a, a feeling that we've got to please the God, but that God is vengeful mm. if there's good, good, uh, yeah, fabulous. So if we drought. do, if we do end up with a flood or a drought or something like that, we may say, "Oh, mm -hmm. this God has somehow removed its blessing from us because 
This is a weather god. This is a god who is intimately tied to agriculture. And if we're not meeting those needs, something must be slightly askew, right? Mm -hmm. But if you feel that way, that means that you will wonder what you did wrong to cause. Yeah, very much. Very much so. Yeah, you probably would be invoking some introspection about what happened here. How did we contribute to this? What went wrong in this relationship? Great. So the point here, and I think it's a point we were all able to nail, was that this God that we imagined in our community was a God who met the most pressing needs of that community. Now, for many of us, we kind of imagined this deity, Zara, as a kind of weather god or a god of the natural world. Zara's love in our scenario is made known to us, perhaps, through good weather, through water supplies, through the availability of nourishing food for the community. And I suspect that the people in this community that you imagined probably could not imagine Zara in any other terms, right? Simply put, if Zara wasn't with them in their agricultural work, what would be the point of Zara? Because the agricultural life is fundamental to the community. Now, why do I have you do this, especially when we're talking about this topic that we are talking about today? Well, my point is actually to help us to see that there's something deeply human about thinking about God in terms that meet our direct survival needs, right? It's difficult to imagine a loving God who is simultaneously ambivalent to the most urgent needs of the community. In this imagined community, agriculture, weather, these are the most important needs. And so God's love is intimately connected with those needs. Well, now let's hop in a time machine, right? Go back in time, kind of back to the time we were imagining. We're going to the Holy <laughs> Land in the time of the Old Testament when people are writing these texts that we have. What do we find? We're going to find actually that we might be a little bit surprised by what we see. Despite it playing a central role in our scriptures, the Israelites are kind of a footnote in the history of geopolitics. They are a small, they are a fairly comparably weak nation. Despite living on the sea, they've got no navy to speak of. In fact, for the lion's share of their history, and scripture bears witness to this, some of the most powerful nations and empires in the world were their neighbors. The Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Babylonians, and so on and so forth. And even on a more localized level, the world in which they live was not defined the way ours are by strict geographic and political borders. And so communities were frequently attacked by neighbors who were seeking access to resources or the expansion of their own political influence. In short, for the ancient Israelites, warfare would have perhaps been seen as central to their very survival. It's an existential issue for them. Just as weather and agriculture were existential issues for the community that you imagined just a few minutes ago. right? So I suspect, if we were back in our time machine, I suspect that the average ancient Israelite lived with a deep-seated fear in their heart. At any moment, they could be invaded, and likely by a military force far superior to their own. And in those days, there was no international law or highly developed moral code to govern warfare. People would have feared for their lives. They would have feared for their children, for their elders, for everything that they know and love. The ability to defend themselves was central to their system of needs. Without it, they wouldn't last very long. History knows of countless groups of people who were destroyed by much stronger adversaries. So, where are we? It's no surprise to me, and it's probably no surprise to you as you work through this a little bit, that the God of the ancient Israelites became defined in no small part by warlike actions. Right? The Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, it's filled with war stories, many of them quite unsettling to read. But for those people, in their unique historical and geographic context, what they needed, or what they assumed they needed at least, was a God who would be with them 
in war and in defense. A God who would bring them complete battlefield success. A God who would guide their commanders. A God who would confound their enemies. A God who could be counted on even in the face of the most fearful opponent. Right? A God who would secure a future peace, often by way of removing enemies from the scene. Right? It's a little bit of a different ethic than we have today. But you can imagine where it's coming from. And so when I read the Bible's difficult war texts, of which there are many, what I see is this need. I see a people who needed a God who would be with them in their fear and in their defense. Many of the difficult texts of the Old Testament remind us of people's trust in a God who would be with them absolutely, who would secure their future absolutely. Now, thankfully, our context is a little bit different today, but I don't think the question is that much different. Right? We live in a nation where we have a very strong defense system. But imagine a different scenario. Imagine being in a small nation without a military force. Imagine being surrounded by enemies. Imagine fearing daily for your family's life, perhaps then, we can understand the creation of stories which show our God to be protector, victor, cunning warrior. Okay, so today we have a similar question, maybe a little bit of a different context. And that question is, what does our need look like when it comes to war? In other words, when, if ever, is war permissible? And under what conditions should we go to war or wage or fight war? These questions are acute ones. Not just for people in uniform like me, but for all of us in this room. For it is in your name that our nation fights. Following two decades of war in Afghanistan and Iraq, we now watch, as we said earlier, as war unfolds in Ukraine and the Holy Land and tensions rise elsewhere. So as citizens, and especially as Christians, we should be thinking about what our faith has to say about that. And so my goal for the time that we've got left this morning, I think it's somewhat simple, right? I want to equip you to think about what is going on in the world in a more faithful way. I'm going to expose you to some of the thought that is out there, help you to think about them in ways that aren't just political or strategic or economic, but distinctly Christian, right? How do we think about this topic better as Christians? So, with that, let's get started. <laughs> okay, need, right? We mentioned earlier in our imagined scenario, we were talking about the question of need. What do we need as people? And so the questions that I think arise for Christians as we think about war is what, if anything, can justify the use of violence, right? Violence feels, I don't know for you, but it feels like it's something that's kind of in contrast to Christ's message of peace, right? So when, if ever, can it be used? And if it can be used, right, what limits should be placed on it? So all of this revolves around our, our question of need. We all have needs as people. We have needs for security. What does it look like? How does violence fit into that, right? Good, hard question. Christians have generally answered this in four principal ways, all right? The first one is pacifism. I'm gonna talk about all these in a little bit, you know, kind of a little depth in a second. But first one's pacifism. The second is this kind of holy war mentality. And sometimes people hear about that, they think about crusading, all right? And that's, that's Part of it, but it's also more complex than that. It's also about using war for means that feel particularly holy, right? Like maybe humanitarian intervention, these kinds of things. The third is preventative war. And the fourth is the just war tradition. I'm going to spend the most time on the just war tradition today, and I'll tell you why in a second, but just to give you the snapshot, it's because this is the one that has been dominant in our religious tradition. It's one that's shaped international law as we know it. It's actually codified in many of our confessions as Presbyterian. I'm not necessarily endorsing that over the others, but you should be aware that that's kind of the prevailing model 
that is shaping the way we think about war in the church historically, but also legally in the military. So let's talk a little bit about these ones. Okay, pacifism, you probably know this. Pacifism generally assumes that violence is, cannot be justified in a Christian worldview. It's incompatible with Christian discipleship, right? Now, we have to make a distinction. When we say pacifism, we don't necessarily mean passive, right? So pacifists are not people that turn a blind eye to injustice in the world. What they say is, if we're going to respond to injustice, we're going to respond in ways and forms that are exclusively nonviolent, right? So this has a rich history in the church. In fact, the church's first couple hundred years, this was the prevailing model, really. Uh, you can find an awful lot of literature from the early first couple centuries where this was, this was really the dominant model. And it still has a stream that has echoed through the church ever since. At times, it pops up and becomes more prevalent, oftentimes in, the, in, uh, in response to war. Right? So we see this. It's a really important thing to be mindful of. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on these individual models, but I just want to make you aware of this, right? So this is one that says, hey, when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, or when Jesus says, love your enemy, right? Or when Jesus tells the disciple to lay his arms down, right? He's not joking, <laughs> right? He really means it. Now, a lot of pacifists would say, would admit, my doctoral advisor, for instance, is a is pacifist scholar, right? He'll tell you this is not the most strategic of choices. Right? <laughs> this is not always the most efficient, but the goal here is discipleship. It's not necessarily efficiency or strategic achievement of goals, right? So that's that's what becomes elevated, is nonviolence. In the holy war model, this was obviously had its moment in the sun, the crusading, right? That's just to say, hey, we can go to war in response to some particular Christian need. The Crusades were basically an attempt to say, you know what will justify war is evangelism, right? We should go to war to spread the gospel where it's not currently violent, right? And so we have that. Very hard to defend that effort. <laughs> but maybe you have a different view on that. But for me, very hard to defend that effort. But here's where it gets a little more complicated in the contemporary world. Think about humanitarian intervention. Should we intervene if a genocide is unfolding in another corner of the world, even though that genocide doesn't undermine our own security? Those are real questions. But that's a question where we would say, hey, in that scenario, might the use of force be justified in response to something that I feel is particularly holy, and that is the care and protection of vulnerable people, right? We've seen it used throughout history in terms of the liberation of Christians. So in communities where Christian communities are facing oppression, genocide, other forms of you know tyranny, people have said, hey, is it, is it justified? Do we have some sort of obligation to rescue or liberate? our brothers and sisters in Christ? Again, really difficult questions to ask and difficult questions to think about. In terms of the third model that we often see, this is preventative war. This is something that's been a live wire in our, in our own country, right? So this is saying, okay, if we have the military capability and we see threats that are emerging, do we not then have a responsibility to neutralize those threats before they materialize, before they turn into genocide, before they turn into tyrannical behavior, before an attack materializes on our own people, right? So we've seen that, like weapons development. We probably all remember this, right? That was the case for uh, some of the conflicts that we had 20 years ago was about weapons of mass destruction, right? That was the argument. And what were they doing? They were saying weapons are in development that could threaten the stability and safety of the world. Okay. 
I'm not passing any judgment on that necessarily, right? I'm just saying that's an example of preventative war. Emerging political threats. Saw this in the Second World War, right? There were people that were writing and saying, hey, this Hitler guy is going to be a problem, right? They were right, right? <laughs> Would they have been justified when they saw the threat start to bubble up before it ever materialized into a threat against them or their own nation, right? That's a question of conscience. And military posturing, we see this a lot, right? Like right now, around the world, there's a lot of posturing. People that are, you know, sailing ships where they don't belong, building islands where they don't belong, all of these kinds of things. It's a way of saying, hey, we're here, we're gonna get a little aggressive, right? What do you do in response to that? I'm giving you a lot to think about, right? <laughs> and I'm not giving you a lot of answers on these, right? And uh, that's sort of intentional, right? Because I just want you to think about this, that get the idea that, hey, this is maybe a little bit more complicated than we might have immediately thought. It's not necessarily this kind of binary thing, right? But let's go to the just war tradition. This has been kind of the dominant one. I, I, you know, I have my quibbles with it, and you'll see some of those quibbles potentially. But I think this is probably a really good model for helping us to think a little bit about how to untangle some of these thorny questions, right? So the just war tradition says, all right, as Christians, we have a bias towards peacemaking, right? We're called to be peacemakers. And yet, we also see that Jesus has interactions with warriors, like Cornelius, right? You see the centurions, you see this stuff, you see in scripture, you see people like David who were warriors, right? So maybe war and conflict has some place within this greater paradigm of peacemaking, right? But it says, if we're gonna use it, we really wanna restrain how we use it, right? So we want to restrain the reasons we go to war and the way that we go to war. So, <coughs> use in bellum, use in bellum, right? Fancy Latin words that make me sound smart when I say them, right? All it means is the right to go to war and right conduct in war. So what that means is this. Under the just war framework, there's two parts that have to be satisfied, right? One is... We can only go to war for certain reasons, right? So if we're going to apply force, we can only do it under certain considerations. And even if those considerations are met, we still have to fight that war in a way that is responsible, that limits harm, that limits death, that limits the adverse impacts of war, right? So it's looking at it on both levels. And let me tell you about the criteria here. Ad bellum, so this is when can you go to war? When can you make that choice to fight? What they would say is this. One, it has to be executed by a competent authority. What does that mean? Well, it means that the people of First Pres Buford, you cannot decide to go to war, right? <laughs> mm. Looking out for your pastor. Right? <laughs> <coughs> you don't get that right, right? War is something that can only be undertaken by a recognized authority that represents the wider public, right? A government, right? So this calls into question some of these armed groups and things like that that exist, right? Number two, you have to have a probability of success. So if we're going to go to war, we have to, if we're going to put lives on the line, if we're going to cause harm to ourselves and others, we have to, at the very least, have some likelihood that we're going to achieve our goals in doing that. Third, and this is where it sometimes gets a little thorny, last resort. What that means is you can't ethically, morally go to war until you have tried the nonviolent alternatives to war. Think diplomacy, right? these kinds of things. War is not something that we just decide without exhausting other options, all right? And just cause. What does just cause mean? Just cause means that if we're going to fight, 
we have to be fighting for a virtuous reason, right? Namely, the preservation of peace, the correction of some grave injustice. We don't go to war because, you know what we want? More land, right? <laughs> you know what we want is more money or more whatever, or we want to capture people or something, right? Those would be unjust causes. So those are the main, you know, the widely considered criteria for going to war. These are the ad bellum uh, criteria here. But let's look at conduct in the context of war. Right? So let's assume that those four criteria have been met. Okay? Just assume in our mind eye. Well, how we fight matters too. We can't say we have a just war if we have all those right reasons for going to war, but we're going to be barbaric when we get there, right? Here's what church historians have said. The first is distinction, sometimes called discrimination, sometimes called non-combatant immunity, right? What it basically says is that there is a difference between war fighters and non-war fighters. And it's only war fighters who are legitimate targets, right? In other words, care must be taken to limit the harm of, that war brings to non-combatant people. It's always wrong to intentionally target civilians. Now, this is complicated, right? As we're seeing play out in the world around us, it's not always so easy. Whereas in the past, we may have had a pitched battle, right? You've probably seen these in movies, right? One army's here, one army's there, and we're going, it's pretty kind of obvious who the combatants are in that, right? They've got metal stuff on, I forget what <laughs> Whatever that's, we don't wear it. Body armor, right? Yeah, they're going to war, they're on their horse, they got their those sticks, you know, whatever. We don't obviously don't use that. I rarely ride a horse, you know? <laughs> but not never. All right? <laughs> in the modern world, it's a little harder, right? Particularly when combatants are enmeshed within the civilian population. Really, really hard, right? So this basically is a duty of care, a responsibility to protect, or sometimes call it. Right? So what it's effectively saying is due care has to be taken to limit civilian harm. There's, there's no calculus here, right? There's no kind of cruel calculus that goes into this. It's really a, a responsibility thing, right? Proportionality. What that basically means is that the military response, the harm that a military inflicts, even on an enemy, has to be proportionate to the injustice that motivated the harm, right? Fancy way of saying, if Commander Adams back there, you know, gives me a, a punch in the chin, I'm probably not justified to burn his house down. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. <laughs> exactly, it ha there has to be a sense of justice, a sense of fairness here, all right? Some people will give another example, right? Like, let's take someone horrific. Let's take someone like Osama bin Laden, right? Let's go back a handful of years when he was alive. Let's say we knew where he was, right? Found him, but to get to him is gonna require killing 10,000 civilians, right, by bombing a particular space. I'm just making up a scenario. Would that be just, right? Well, what you're getting to there is a question of proportionality, right? What is the right level of response? It's difficult. Again, there's no, no easy calculus with that. The third is military necessity. What that means is that your targets have to have a valid military purpose, right? I can't go, not me, but some combatant, can't go and say, you know what looks like a good target is that school over there, assuming that school has no military value, right? Like, we can't say, oh, I'm gonna blow up that target just to invoke psychological or community harm, right? What it's basically saying is that if you're going to attack someone or something, it has to have a purpose that is directly connected to your just cause, right? Number four, mala and say, again, Latin term, doesn't matter. It just means evil in itself. 
You can't use weapons or tactics that are intrinsically evil. Now, what classifies something as intrinsically evil? I don't know, right? That's, again, a question of, of morality, right? But think about something like the use of sexual violence in war, right? You see this happening. I think it's probably fair to say that that's inherently evil, right? Even if, and I, this is a big if, I can't imagine a scenario, but even if that could contribute to war fighting success, which I don't think it ever will, it would never be justified because it's an inherently evil act, right? Taking people and enslaving them, stuff like this, right? And some people are gonna ask, they're gonna extend this into certain weapons, chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, right? They may say, hey, chemical weapons cause undue suffering to people, right? Some people will say this in accordance with stuff like landmines, right? There's a, um, oh, I'm gonna challenge my biblical literacy. I think it's in Deuteronomy. There's a section on the, the laws of war. And one of the things it says is, you know, you can have all these legitimate targets, but do not chop down the olive trees, right? What? Like, why, why? Well, think about it. Olive trees take a heck of a long time to grow. So even after war has ended, you are undermining people's food supply and their ability to farm and things like that. So you're extending the conflict beyond its natural boundary. Some people apply that same logic to things like landmines, right? Where they pose a threat to people, particularly civilians, even after war has ended. So again, these, are, these aren't obviously easily defined things, but they are considerations that should be playing out in the back of our mind, right? When you're thinking about the stuff you see on the news or when people in uniform like us are thinking about weapons and tactics, these are the things that people are thinking about. So let's talk about how this works kind of in a reformed tradition. And I've sort of mentioned a little bit that, hey, we've seen this in our confessional documents. Um, we're thinking particularly of the Westminster Confession. Uh, the Second Helvetic Confession makes particular use of um, just word tradition. But where does that come from? Anyone know that guy? Calvin. Yeah. <laughs> what a guy. All right. <laughs> Calvin and others. I'm making sweeping kind of assumptions of um, reformed thinkers and even pre-reformation thinkers, right? Calvin's drawing on people like St. Augustine. They have a fairly well-developed theological distinction of church and state, right? In other words, the idea is this. God calls the church and the individuals that comprise it to particular functions, tasks, peacemaking, all of these things. And God calls the state to something different, right? And so the way that you assess the ethics of these two bodies is different. It would be wrong for Mary to go to war against me or to kill me right now, right? I hope I didn't hear a lot of agreement. <laughs> you know? Sorry. So you're off the hook. <laughs> now, but it would be wrong. It would be wrong in most circumstances for her to do some sort of harm like that to me, right? Because we are judging her by the ethical criteria of the church, of the individual life. But at the same time, we know that the state is called to other things. I mean, it's drawing off Calvin, right? So the state, for instance, has the ability to detain people. If Mary detained me, that would be kidnapping, right? But our jails are full of people that are detained, right? If Mary caused me some grievous harm, we would probably broadly assume that that was an unjust act. But is there not a space in political theology for the state to use, to use violence? We talked about there might be. Right? So the criteria is, is slightly different, right? What we call immoral here or unethical here may not be universally immoral here. This comes from kind of this reformed political ideology. It's basically saying that these two bodies have distinct callings from God, right? And for the state, one of those callings is to ensure the common defense, right? 
and he would invoke justice. I'm not necessarily saying that's the way you should interpret scripture, right? You do it according to your conscience. But that's where this kind of comes from, is this idea that the state has some particular norms that are, uh, that are unique to it. In a second, I'm going to pivot to talking a little bit about our work as Presbyterian chaplains. But I want to pause here. I've given like a lot of, a lot of stuff to think about, right? A lot of different perspectives and things. I'm curious um, if we take a minute or two. I'll, I'll get to I'll get to some case studies and stuff in a minute. But is there anything where you're like, oh, I do not understand what you just said there, right? <laughs> Great job. <laughs> I confuse myself. I'm glad I don't confuse everyone else. Let me just talk. Say a word about Presbyterian military chaplains um, and federal chaplains, because it may or may not be something you know about. Um, as Mary so nicely told you earlier, I'm an ordained Presbyterian minister, right? All chaplains that are endorsed for federal service are ordained ministers, right? This is our unique ministry. In some cases, I consider myself um, as something of a missionary of the church, right? Mm -hmm go into a particular community to bring good news there, right? In my case, the community that I go into is not necessarily a foreign country, although it is sometimes that, but is a particular community that wrestles with particular issues. Some of these issues that we, that we just talked about, these are things that the people I serve are wrestling with in a very real way. You know, I have people that come into my office who are wrestling with these questions. People that have killed, right? People who are facing the prospect of killing in the future. That's hard. I don't care who you are, right? And so it helps to be able to help them and to bring some good news, to bring forgiveness, to bring mercy, to bring direction to these individuals, right? So PCUSA has chaplains that serve in all branches. So Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Space Force. So the Marine Corps is funny, right? I'm in Navy uniform, but I work at uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot. The reason for that is because as Navy chaplains, our mission set's a little broader. We serve the Navy, the Marine Corps, and even the Coast Guard. And there's a couple bullets in the, the uh, Merchant, Merchant Marine. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, Merchant Marine Academy, mainly. All right. So we serve across across service lines, which is unique. We're non-combatants, which means we aren't involved in offensive military operations. We might go with our people, but we aren't firing weapons. All right. I don't receive weapons training. I'm purely there as a pastoral guide, all right, as a shepherd to my people in the midst of conflict. In the Navy, these are our four core competencies. Pro so they provide, facilitate, care, and advise. What does that mean? Right? What it means is this. We provide for the religious needs of people that are within our religious tradition. So for me, I can be no other than a Presbyterian pastor. Right? Chaplain Adams back there, Southern Baptist Convention? Yep, he can be no other than Southern Baptist pastor. We are who we are. We're endorsed by a particular tradition. We provide directly for people in our tradition. If you were to come to church on Paris Island and I was leading it, you would be like, wow, this is really recognizable. Because it is. It's a Presbyterian service. If he was leading worship, it would be a Southern Baptist service. Right? That's what we mean when we say we're providing for people within our tradition. We're facilitating for people who aren't. Right? I have people under my care who are from any number of religious traditions and none. If I can't be the one that can, in good conscience, provide for their particular needs, I can't, you know, like I can't pretend to be a, a rabbi or an imam or a priest. I can't, I won't, I shouldn't. Right? I can help connect them to resources so that their First Amendment rights and, more importantly, probably, their spiritual needs are met. We provide care to all people. That often takes the form of counseling, confidential counseling. We make a safe space for them to be able to unload what they're wrestling with, to find some direction, to find some care um, at any given moment. Even though we're talking about questions of war today, 
I would say that most of my care deals with people that are having relationship issues, that are wondering about their future, that have maybe made a mistake in life and are trying to find a sense of forgiveness. You know, these kinds of things, right? People that are wondering, how do I serve my community better? All of these important questions that probably all wrestle with, right? And advise. Advise means that we're part of a chain of command and we are responsible for providing our command team with advice about ethics, about religious needs, um, morale, these kinds of things. So we've become kind of the subject matter expert on those areas. Sound good? Okay. Now, I'm going to be kind of mean here. <laughs> oh, so I have a question. Oh, yeah. I, I, I couldn't remember before what you asked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you talk about a just war, uh -huh. um, who's defining that? In other words, you might say that as a chaplain, uh -huh. but how about the general or whatever that may not agree with you, what a just war is? Where does that come from? Yeah, great, good. So the question was, if, if we didn't hear, where, where, who defines what a just war is, right? Where, where does this come from? Who gets that say? The answer is, it's kind of an interdisciplinary thing. Hopefully, they're listening to folks like us, right? Hopefully, they're saying, you're our ethical advisor on these matters. What do you think, right? But also, a lot of these principles, in fact, all of these principles that I showed you, the, the four ad bellum and the four in bello principles, those are also enshrined in international law. Now, we all know law is not universally adhered to, right? I sped on the way over here, right? <laughs> Help. But you know what I mean, right? He was behind me. I thought he was a police officer, right? I was a little worried. I was like, oh, caps on brakes, you know? But, but that's the idea, right? We have laws, right? They should be followed. But in the complexity of, of war, they, we often see they're not, right? Um, and so it's a great question. There's a theologian named Oliver O'Donovan, who I really like, who's written on this topic quite a bit. And he says, I might be oversimplifying him here, but he says, it might be helpful to think about just war and military ethics in large part on sort of a continuum from wholly unjust, right? to ideally just, and asking where our actions sit on that continuum. So as opposed to seeing it as wrong right, in the realities and complexities of modern combat, where do we sit on there? And in that sense, the just war tradition is just as much a decision-making tool, right? So it's a tool of saying, should we, should we not do this, as it is a tool of critique, right? I actually hope that these just war tradition frameworks that we've given you give you the opportunity to better critique military action, right? So it's not just about what's permissible, but also what's not, right? And so maybe that's an easier way to think of it, but in large part, to answer your question, I would probably appeal to international law. Um, we call it the Laws of Armed Conflict, or IHL, International Humanitarian Law, um, which is basically the laws of war. Um, where many of these are enshrined. Okay, so I'm gonna be a little cruel, all right? And what I mean by that is I'm about to give you a case study, okay? These are real case studies. They're drawn from history, although I've, you know, <coughs> scrubbed details from them. But I wanna put you in a particular seat, and I wanna make this real for you a little bit. And so I want you to think about this, and rather than say, yeah, do this, do that, what I want you to consider is what issues does this raise, and maybe how does some of the stuff that we talk about, how might it help us to untangle these issues, right? Now, the reason that I'm doing this is because some of these scenarios are the kind of things that we're reading in the newspaper, or we will read in the newspaper, right? And I want us to be able to think about them through the unique lens of faith. All right, so let's imagine this one. You are a military commander. Good for you. You've moved up the chain of command there. All right? You've just received intelligence 
demonstrating that the enemy has stockpiled explosives in the basement of an active medical facility filled with patients. Intelligence also suggests that these explosives will soon be used in a terrorist attack against the citizens of your nation. Right? You're a Christian. As a Christian, you want to make an ethical decision here. It's a complex reality. What factors do you consider before making your decision? Sir? Well, how reliable is the information that you're getting? Okay. So you're gonna you're gonna wonder about where where's my intelligence coming from, right? I don't wanna I don't wanna act on bad intelligence. Yeah, good. Well, yeah, some of the man's up. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the balance between what is a potential loss of life if those munitions are deployed yep. versus the potential loss of life for attacking the hospital, for lack of better. Exactly. So the term that you're you're alluding to there is proportionality. Right. Right. So what, what's the, this kind of cruel calculus that I talked about? What's the uh, proportionality? That's a, a real live issue that you're gonna be thinking about in a context like this. What else? Do we have a specialized group that could go in and take care of the bad guys? <laughs> Believe it or not, we do. <laughs> <laughs> but, in this case, before we even decide what we're going to do, right, before we even decide on our, our approaches, the question that we want to ask is, you know, what are we considering here? So who, who's in the hospital? Doctors, yeah. nurses. Are these people typically combatants? No. no. Right. So do you remember what the, uh, the principle that we were wrestling with earlier in, in Just War was? It's called this distinction, right? Distinction, discrimination, non-combatant immunity, right? So that's going to be a live issue here, right? We've talked about right here in this, we have a proportionality issue that we want to be thinking through and weighing. We have a non-combatant immunity issue, right? Are we intentionally targeting civilians, all right? We've got intelligence issues about the reliability and trustworthiness of data that we want to be able to look at. Yeah, all, all good things, all right? So this is, this is a good example of something in... In real time. Let me give you another one. You have been elected president. Oh. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> you are the president of a country. Far away, a genocide is unfolding in another nation. The images of starving, tortured, and fearful people are haunting you. And your citizens, who are increasingly seeing this stuff on the news, are increasingly expecting some sort of action. Yet, these very same events pose no direct threat to your nation. Your vice president, let's say me, right? I don't, want, I don't want to be president, but I'll be vice, right? I come to you and I say, Mr. and Mrs. President, hey, what are we doing here? Our popularity is starting to go down the tube, right? And people are seeing all this. What do we do? The people are demanding action. What do you consider when weighing whether to apply military force in this question? You know, would, is, has diplomacy failed? Great, so last resort, right? right? So we're looking at it and we're saying, okay, good. Maybe, maybe, maybe potentially, there will be a cause for military action in the future, but have we exhausted other issues. Have we engaged with this other country? Have we tried sanction? Have we tried, you know, whatever else we want to want to deploy? Good. Yeah. What, what else? Are we acting as a coalition with other nations or other interested parties? Great. Right? So who's harmed here? Is this, is this a harm that's invoked on us? Is this a harm that's invoked on kind of the conscience of the wider global population? And in which case, who has the right to go to war here, right? So this is where the United Nations comes in, where the United Nations and other international coalitions say, when we have these kinds of issues, this is where our authority sort of really comes to the fore. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you did have one of the criteria, humanitarian issue. This is clearly a humanitarian issue. Mm -hmm. You know, as Christian, you don't just think about what's happening to me, but what's happening to other people. Uh -huh. Yep, so that is, that's a, I'm really glad you pointed that out, because that humanitarian intervention bullet was put under that, that kind of holy war, which is just 
broad thing, holy war thing, right? So a strict just war theorist, all right? And again, think of it on a continuum. A strict just war theorist would say, no, we have no more right to go to war here, right? But you can see how these things bleed together, right? So what are, what other issues? Yeah. Um, because it's the presidency, is it an election year? I see an election. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I'm not saying. No, I, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, no, but you're right. Right. So yeah. there's political issues that sure. go in, into these kinds of things. Yeah. There and there is an overlap for sure between, you know, to what extent might this enable you to do other things, right? What else do we see in here? I know you've mentioned this already, but pulling away, um, charging them extra taxes or doing that kind of thing with our government so that, yeah, it deprives the people, but it also deprives the government, which is who you're working with anyhow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So let me, almost drawing a distinction here, going back to that distinction principle of who, what are we looking at here? Right? Who, who is harmed? Who is not harmed? Who has authority? Who doesn't have authority? These kinds of things. Yeah, good. Well, I guess my thought is that if you think about the state, you know, there's more people involved in making yeah. that decision other than the president. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grossly oversimplifying So what, what would you consider? Well, he's got to get input and there's got, has got to be a consensus amongst mm -hmm. people that Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So who are we drawing into the dialogue here? Right. That's a really good question. And I'm actually, I didn't even think about it, but I'm glad you said it. Right. Because there was a question, I think, I think you asked the question about who decides whether it's just war. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that you're going to say is, all right, I know that these discussions are interdisciplinary in nature. They have a spiritual component. They have a legal component, perhaps have a political component. They have all of these elements to it. So who am I bringing into the decision, right? I don't want to take a decision unilaterally that I may not have all the, all the pieces for. Good, yeah. I was just thinking as well, it's like the citizens are expecting some sort of action, yeah. but as the president, I mean, are they, what sort of action are they expecting and would they support funding? Yeah, to exactly. That kind of goes back to this question, right? Of, yeah. of, of political issues. Right? Another question that I would think about here is, quite sadly, I think, it breaks my heart, I hope it breaks yours too, humanitarian crises are occurring right now, you know, a ton of places. So one of the challenges with humanitarian intervention, right, one of the critiques of it as a, uh, a motivation for war is basically how do you decide? Right? When does one crisis rise to the level of needing a military response while another does not? Right? How do you how do you decide in these court, in these situations? And I don't know. Right? I don't know. Right? But it, these are this kind of this complicated and what we're dealing things to consider with today. If we are we are supposedly allies and friends of a country, we might be doing that. Yeah. Well, see, all these. All these political issues that that weigh in, and, and they're issues of the heart, they're issues of the law, they're issues of um, they're issues of politics. They're they're all of those things kind of woven together, for sure. Economic, economic, right? Yep, yeah. all sorts of questions. The troubled spot is uh, economic being important because there are more money. Yeah, and it's an interesting thing to say is like. What motivates us? I don't know if you've ever um, spent any time with uh, Thomas Aquinas, right? I, good if you didn't, right? <laughs> Pain in the neck, you know? But he, he spends a lot of time thinking about intentionality. Like for him, intentions are the gauge of whether something is moral or immoral, right? So, I don't know, take a random example. Right? I, I don't know why, I don't, it must be a psychological fear here, but if, if you kill me right now <laughs> because you want to kill me, right? it's a deeply unjust act, 
right? Because you're motivated by anger or desire to do harm or something like that. Now, if I come at you to harm you and you respond to preserve your life, someone like Aquinas would say, that's probably not an unjust act because your intentions were different, even though the result is the same. And that's Ian Clark laying on the floor, right? So on a national level, we can think about those questions too. Like, what is our intention? And I think that goes back to uh, the question of just cause, right? In the just war tradition, where it's saying, what is our North Star in this conflict, right? What are we seeking? What are we preserving? What is our goal? What is our kind of spiritual intention there? Okay, I've talked to you for the better part of an hour. Um, Put this aside for a second. Curious what questions you have for a few minutes. Things that are on, on your mind that I'm wrestling with or that you're just wondering about. So on a national level, do we have any sort of, I don't know if the right word is legal or not, but do we have any sort of commitment to a just war theory for the United States? I would say yes. Um, I would say yes. I, I'd say that uh, international law, which we are bound to uphold as well, um, is largely informed by the just war tradition, mm. right? A lot of these same principles, in some cases they may be, I'll call them a kind of secularized, mm. but the underlying principles are there and are pretty well developed, mm. right? In my pocket right now, I hope it's put in the bag actually. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Geneva Conventions ID card, right? We're not in Switzerland. Why do I have a Geneva Conventions card? because we're signatories to international law, right? We've committed to fight in <coughs> accordance with certain ethical, moral, legal parameters, right? Um, and so I would say that's probably And they're pretty that. much driven by the, the oh, cool. Yeah. Yep. Good, good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I was a military veteran in the combat branch back years ago. And okay. You know, some of the things you're talking about, I think were things that were pretty well talked about then. Right. But I'm wondering about uh, uh, how you're doing as a military guy uh, with the people within the military. Because, uh, you know, the ch church struggles today with less people that are mm -hmm. active. And how do we spread the message? And yeah. I'm wondering, uh, how do you uh, deal with the people that have no connection at all with you all directly, you yeah. know, the, we had back then, we had the Lieutenant Cali kind of people, yeah. that were, they couldn't wait to have any war, because they just wanted to get out there and sure. create havoc, you know? Sure. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you something, um, one thing I wish, and I don't know, maybe it's possible, um, I wish you could see what's going on at Paris Island on a Sunday morning. Sir, what, you're probably closer to the numbers on this. I, let's say in the summer when we're at our, our peak, how many people do we have in worship? These are 18 year olds. So across faith groups, yes, sir. Um, averaging around 72 to 78% of all recruits are in some type of religious service. Mm -hmm. And the one that Ian and I are closely associated with is Protestant Chaplain. Uh, on any given Sunday morning in the hour and 45 minutes that we have them for religious education and then a worship service, um, we will run typically around 3,200 people. And so, for instance, when it's Ian's week to preach. The number goes way down like mine. <laughs> <laughs> He's preaching to about 3,200 people in one building at one time. Yeah, and, and, and what's remarkable about that is that those people are 18, 19, 20 years old, right? Many of them have limited or no background in faith, right? But what does that speak to, I think? It speaks to this idea that when someone shows up at a place like Paris Island or any military service, we take a whole lot away from them. We cut their hair off take your uniform off and we give them this thing. You know, we, we change the way they speak. We change the rules that they follow. We take away their privacy, right? They're sleeping literally in a giant room with bunk beds. We take away their control over their schedule. Most importantly, for a lot of young people, take this thing away, right? We take away their internet, we take away, we take away everything. 
And they start asking, if I'm not those things, then who or what am I? Right? What matters most? And for a lot of people, even people that have come into this with no faith background, those questions lead them there. Right? And so we have this profound opportunity to, uh, to minister to people in that way. And so, the, yeah, so the question I think is, um, you know, how do, we, how do we connect with people? I think we keep doing what we've been doing, you know, what the church has been doing for 2,000 years. And that's loving people, bringing good news to them, kind of meeting them where they are. I mentioned I, I alluded to this idea of seeing myself as a sort of missionary, kind of the same way, right? If I was going to go be a missionary in some distant country, what would I have to do? I'd have to learn the language. I'd have to understand the culture. I'd have to get, understand the rhythm and the needs, right, so that I could serve those people better. Same thing for chaplains in the military, right? That's the reason that we wear the uniform we wear. That's the reason I have this bad haircut, right? <laughs> That's the reason I have all these things, right? Um, it's because it enables us to serve people well, right? And I think the, the answer to your question is somewhere in people's hearts, even sometimes beyond a bunch of layers, there's a yearning for hope and mercy, good news, um, and something bigger than themselves. Any other questions, concerns? I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Our family was military for a lot of years. Uh, my father drove a tank in the British Army for six years and came out of uh, France at Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. So we understood sacrifice, and my time was Vietnam. Uh, wars are in different parts of the world, as you well know, and they come from countries that have different languages and religions than yep. ours. We uh, go to war against a country with a different religion, whether it be Japan during World War II or Islam in the Middle East today. How cloudy does your presentation get? Very. Yeah, very. So this way of thinking about military ethics is what I would call a Western normative view of ethics, right? comes out of the Catholic and ultimately Reformed tradition, right? Different corners of the world are going to think about ethics quite differently, and they're going to have different motivations, right? And that's a deep challenge for us, right? Even in a society that, you know, <coughs> may become increasingly less reliant on uh, religious language or religious philosophy, there's still kind of a, a way of thinking that has been shaped by that tradition. Um, and it's not so in, in every part of the world. Um, and that is a hard thing, right? Because it makes engagement all the more difficult. Um, I think it's a call for, for us to remember that we need to be holding true to our own convictions and holding true to our own principles and values as best we can, even if it's not reciprocated. Um, but you're right, it's, it's, a very, it's a very real issue. Um, if you look at some conflicts that are, are going on in the world today, right, the way that sometimes people think about, about the ethics there is, is different, right? The motivations can be different. Um, that's, that is hard, absolutely. The clash between different countries, different religions is tough. But when the clash is among Christians, such as in World War I, the Germans on their belt buckle said, God is with us. Mm -hmm. That's even worse. Absolutely. Yeah, it raises a, an awful lot of questions. And we can see, I think, I'm glad you brought that up, because I think we can see through some of those examples that Christians don't necessarily have a monopoly on peacemaking, right? Even within our own tradition, um, there's going to be different approaches to this. And there's going to be people that embrace conflict, right? And so all the more reason, I think, to be studying and, and thinking about these things um, in a thoughtful way, because it is hard. And, it, and it's only gonna get more complicated, right? Think about my, my doctoral work is in cyber warfare, right? Cyber warfare is, what does that mean? To fight in a, a different domain now. What does it mean to have conflict that can be waged at a lower level of harm, 
but also can circumvent and sometimes short circuit some of the con conventional restrictions on war. So and we see sort of conflict being more, you know, more widespread, even if at a lower level. Um, these are difficult questions, and they're and they're not going to get easier to answer. Which is part of the reason I'm so glad you all are here, right? Because <laughs> these, wrestling with these things and thinking about them, and part of the reason that I, I didn't necessarily just give you all the the answers is because there, there aren't any answers, but also because it gets you in the mode of thinking. So tomorrow, when you open up the newspaper, you know, or look at you know some news site, right? You can ask yourself, what's going on? How might I think about this in a different way? What tools might I, I lean on? What might different traditions and different approaches um, have to say about this? So, all good questions. But um, as we close out here, do you mind if I say a word of prayer for you? Please. Be right. God, who is love, we thank you for the opportunity to gather today to wrestle with one of the most complex and challenging issues that exists in our world today, and that's the issue of warfare. Our hearts break for those who have been harmed by war, for families and communities around the world and throughout time and space who have been impacted in adverse ways, who've experienced death and injury, fear. We ask that you be with all of them and that you invite us all to become peacemakers move our hearts in the direction of peace so that our cause may always be just. Give us the humility to challenge some of our preconceived notions. Give us the opportunity to look critically at the world around us and inspire us to act justly in all circumstances. And help us to wrestle with your word, for we know that it is good, that it is also not always easy. And so let us work together as your church to find your sense of truth, and love, and mercy in the midst of it all. It's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to Mary and folks from 55 and up and going. Um, and for y'all for being here. Uh, most of you know me as the pastor of the church, but I see that there are also a few visitors and guests in our midst. Um, welcome. Hope that this has been something that will set a tone for future opportunities to gather and um, love to get you back to talk a little bit more um, about some of the specifics of the things that you're working on. Um, if you need an audience to explore any of that stuff uh, when it comes to those. If you want to talk about cyber warfare, we can go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 believe me, there's people out here that would, would love to no, talk about it. Um, also do want to pitch to you who've not uh, already heard this, um, who are part of the congregation, but on this Thursday at 10.30, from 10.30 to about 11.15, and the following Thursday, I'm going to be presenting using primarily a work from uh, my Old Testament professor, you'll hear me talk about him like he's my best friend, um, Walter Brueggemann, who has a, a very short but really, really meaty book about um, the biblical approach and understanding of what's happened in Israel and Palestine over a number of years. So it's not something he's written in response to the most recent conflict, um, but I have gone through it a couple of times. I'm not going to be handing it out, um, so we're going to probably hit some highlights, but I know a lot of folks have been asking about, you know, is there some things that we ought to be thinking about, um, if not engaging in, when it comes to what's going on uh, with Israel and Palestine currently. So open invitation. Um, for you, I know several of y'all are already with me on Thursday mornings regularly, um, but for any of the rest of you, uh, this Thursday at 10.30 and the following Thursday at 10.30 as well, you are all most welcome. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Can, I, can I do one more? This is, uh, we welcome you for the 55 up and going group, okay? Uh, this is a wonderful turnout and we're so pleased but there's something else coming up, and I don't know that it is on the same level as this, but we try to give a variety, okay? So uh, on Monday, February 5th, we're meeting at USCB for a book sandwiched in, and it's from 12 to 1, and I want to read you what this is. Uh, the book that they're talking about is Hurricane Jim Crow, okay? Published in 2022. I went on Amazon to look at it, and it only had two 
reviews, but both of them are five star. So this is good. Loved by me. And I want to tell you real fast. It said uh, the blurb that they put out is 1893. The hurricane struck the Low Country. Thousands died. Most of these people were black. But this book is a history of the disasters and aftermath as the future of the area, that is the low country, was decided among black workers and politicians, white landowners and former slave owners, northern interlocutors and humanitarians, all of these people meeting together on the muddy, disastrous low country. And so anyway, 12 to 1. However, Mita said in the lobby at 11.30 for cookies and coffee. <laughs> That's February 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Good stuff. <laughs>